Alrighty, welcome back. Play Basic Coders. Um, this is more of a demonstration or a discussion about the array commands. What I've done is I've made a, uh, an application here that does what's called palette mapping. If I run the example, the one on the left is the picture just loaded off the hard drive. It's an uh, RGB format. The one on the right is converted to a palette. In other words, we have a list of all the unique colors in this image. And then we have, an, for each pixel, we have an index into that list of colors, into the palette. Um, so this particular image has 260-odd thousand unique pixels. Sorry, uh, total pixels. Uh, we have 46,000 and change unique colors. And the way it does it is really just it, it grabs all of the pixels out of the image. Let's we'll go through it. So we've got two functions here compute unique palette. So we're passing the image in and an array, getting our size. Uh, stepping through, I'm actually copying a row of pixels uh, directly from the image into the array, which is what this here is doing then calling sort. Since, since we need to have a, a master palette of all the unique colors, I'm grabbing row by row, calling sort on each row, so they're in ascending order from the index zero will be the lowest number, because a color is just an integer number, it's just a 32-bit number. We're just treating certain bits from it to be part of the red channel, other bits are part of the green, but they just make up a value. Now, this sorts the row, it doesn't, but the row might actually have, you know, a hundred pixels all the same color in, in it. Now we're going through and culling out anything, any two pair of pixels or more that are the same, we just remove them. So we end up with, with the, the unique colors for that row. So we step through its scan line, we copy the sorted and cleaned up version of uh, each row. We add them to this main buffer. Keep doing that for each, each scan line. Then at the end of this, we sort the palette because the palette, each row might have had the same colors on it. And we do the same thing here. I mean, technically, we probably don't really need that, really, do we? We probably could just go, hey, uh, dump this stuff here, copy the, the row across, and then sort it at the end. Yeah. I didn't check to see if there's any benefit or detriment for doing that, but that's probably the same, I would say. Uh, but that's not, not really the point, actually. The, uh, the point of this conversation is about things like sort array, these copy array cells, sort array. So this first pass creates the palette, but the original colors in the image are still RGBs. We need them to be an index into the palette so we can recreate the image from that if we need to. Now, I've just picked this, this as an example to do. Um, this is the actual palette map function. So we pass it in and newly created palette array which has all of the, the unique colors so when we ran this before the total number of pixels is 262,144 in this image uh, I think that's 512 by 512 but the number of unique colors that were in the palette is 46,000 so what does that give us? About 25% roughly, I guess, somewhere in there, of those colors that are, that are unique, so they're repeated many times. Uh, first pass takes us 55 milliseconds. Second pass took a longer time, so we're refreshing the screen. In order to convert the original image RGB, we need to do a search of this palette array. So what, we, what I'm doing is just stepping through each pixel just going row by row across it, all the way down. And for each pixel, I'm searching this palette array. 
That's why they're sorted. You know, if they weren't sorted, we, we could just do a search and just be done with it. I mean, it wouldn't matter, actually, if they were sorted or not. We just do a, a raw linear search. But in that context, potentially for each pixel in here, in this image, if we, we would have to search through, let's say we're searching to the end of the array and that would be a potential 46,000 iterations for each dot. Which might not sound like much, but when, you, when you've got 26,000, sorry, 260 thousand, uh, pixels, that's a huge amount of work. And it really just comes down to during the palette mapping instruct uh, part here, we're using find array. And that's a linear process. It just as it just starts from the cell you give it and steps through until it finds it the first answer, first thing that matches what we're searching for. Uh, or we have no find whatsoever. So it returns a negative one, which is what this, this this here is just giving us an indicator of whether we we're not working correctly. You know, have we found every single possible color or not? Um, there's a value down here that, that is the if you look here. We've got broken, and we're actually calling that function two hundred and thirty six thousand times out of the two hundred and sixty two thousand pixels. We're getting away. We're able to avoid calling it sometimes because we we just happen to be obviously testing color zero or or these things here. Or um, it does screen out if the current pixel you're looking at is the same as the last one and if it, if it is it just uses the same index mm. so initially when I tried this it was you know without with it, if you just set set these to low and high if we avoid this little binary chop search in the middle here And we, so now what we're doing so should be, but the problem with this is we're doing a linear search through every single one and that took two seconds to do. Now we're calling a machine code function. That search is pretty much, it just has a read from memory, a comparison and a loop back. There's almost nothing in it. Right. But if we do a bit of our searching here, we do what's called a binary chop search. In PB code, what we're doing is we, we, we're saying, uh, what's the range of the palette? In other words, what's the, what's, what's the number of colors? And how many times do we want to run this logic? So we're setting the high and low to the, the bounds, the highest and lowest index in the palette. Compute the midpoint grab this midpoint RGB, compare it to our current color. If it happens to be a match, great, we're done, we're out. If it's not, if the current RGB is lower than this midpoint RGB, we bring, we, this color is, we don't, this color is in the bottom half of the palette. If it's, if this is not true, then it's in the top half of the palette. We move the low point up. We keep repeating this a set number of times. So we're doing a search, we're searching X number of times to bring down the guess or to make a better guess of where we should start searching within this palette array here. That's what binary chop searches do. That's why it needs to be uh, sorted as well, actually. Uh, when we do this, this lot, the more times we iterate this loop, the closer high and low get. And they, and they no matter where the, the, the color falls within our palette, we're, we're sort of halving the color range each iteration. So we do it once, then we have a search that's, it, that's half the size of the palette. We do it twice, then we're searching a quarter of the palette potentially. Three times we're searching an eighth of the palette, four, a sixteenth, etc. Um, here I've just done a bit of a, a, a quick comparison to work out 
what our maximum search depth should be, assuming that we're okay with doing linear searches of 16 values. So we're taking the original palette, dividing it by 16, and comparing that with our powers of two, and it gives us a rough search depth. Now, what I wanted to get to is that, hopefully you're sort of following this, the, um, that's a reasonably sized image. We go to the screen, there's a screenshot there of, uh, one of Steve's screenshots. So that one took four seconds to do the translation. You can see that the palette's more obvious in this section here where these are strips of the same color, so they, they tend to compute out to be the same thing. It's this searching here. We've got 820 odd thousand pixels and we've done 64,000 searches of that with a potential search distance of only 16 pixels within that. Uh, the runtime, like the PV runtime, if we give it a bigger image, this is a photograph. This takes actually a number of seconds to complete. That's showing the original loaded image. It took 666 milliseconds to, to, to compute the palette. And we'll see how long it takes to, to do the actual mapping. We haven't even done one, one block yet, so it takes a fair while. Uh, what We're looking at, what, 12 million possible pixels and a palette of 420,000, 22,000 colors, I guess. Which means if you do a raw search of every pixel, you're doing a hundred, well, 12 million times a potential 420,000 searches. Yeah, that, that is not going to be fast in anyone's language. Wow, we took... How many milliseconds is that? We took 580 milliseconds. That's an incredible amount of time. So out of the... 12 million pixels, we did 11 million, if I'm reading that right, actual searches or calls to uh, find cell. And a potential search depth of, depth of 15. Oh, yeah, okay. So clearly what we actually need is uh, find a way to have like a, a binary chop search. And I think there's a lot of overhead in even calling this function. Um, another one we probably need is something like filter array or something like that to, to do this kind of reduction here. We've got an array full of values and we want to come up with a unique one. Sorting here th needs things like um, if you could sort an array and you said, well, hey, here's, here's my palette, let's say. But this is destructive, because it's going to modify a palette, isn't it? So what if you had something like, you know, that's your palette, um, that's your range of values you want, you want to sort from this thing. Maybe you have like an output palette here. So it dumped, dumped this data from here across into here or it created like an index. Um, so this was a field full of the indexes of which ones these relate to. You know what I mean? So this palette wouldn't be changed, but you could, ref you could use the indexes in here to refer back to this, these colors. Which is kind of giving you a reverse of this other thing over here. Um, I, I think the thing that would be very useful in things like uh, when you have uh, strings arrays, for example. Even, even like picking the, the sort method, then you need you know you need more parameters. 
hard to sort of, you know, one of the things that there was, uh, people didn't like back in the early days uh, coming from sort of, I guess the dark basic days into DB Pro was that people didn't like optional parameters, they didn't like having too many switches in, in functions and I, look, I tend to agree with that to be honest. I mean, you could have a structure with with a whole bunch of modes or whatever you, you set up in it. Even a string, perhaps, you know. Um, right. Um, yeah, so for searching and sorting, we need something like that. And these need to be... These need to be called faster from the VM. Uh, they're different. They're not like normal functions, actually. They're... Because they're when you pass an array into like a sort function or what's the other one's gone? These uh, find array cells or these ones here. It has to do it. It has to work out what kind of array this actually is. It doesn't know. From here, it looks like well, we're, doing, we're calling sort array on an integer array. And it passes the handle of the array in at this time, and but the actual sort function has some logic in it to work out what kind of data type we need to sort. Because stored inside this structure, so so efficiency-wise, it would be better to have this work out. You know. Uh, that's an integer. Let's just call the int sort array, array function. Let's save ourselves a, a bit of extra, uh, one extra sort of logic fall through. I think what I'll do is I'll have a look. I'll have a look at these, how they've done in the VM, and I think it'd be nice to have a binary chop built into this. What I might do is I might have a look at the array functions that are in 165 and just see if there's any room for... Like if we have, a, we have a... I'm pretty sure we can have you know an optional switch at the end there to have uh, what kind of search you want to do. That'd be pretty handy. So you know, having binary chopping built in, built into the function itself would save us doing this this work here. Uh, and I know that it's pretty pretty fast, and on the other end, it wouldn't be perfect, but you'd be able to get this kind of brute force processing stuff done much better. But I, I suspect there's a lot of time lost just calling this function. If, if I optimize, sorry, if I just clip that out for a second, we we'll run the same program, same image. We we'll just count how long it takes to do the Bari chops. Almost no time at all. So it took five seconds to run through, but calling that search function, the 12, sorry, 120 million, what is it? What have we got? One. Yeah, sorry, 12 million times it's costing us an enormous amount of time there's obviously a big bottleneck in calling those functions and that, that needs to be improved I mean just making it, if we can shuffle that around a little bit and make that, that calling be quicker up front then programs that rely upon this kind of behaviour we do lots of searches will be much much more um, much more viable with big data, data sets and they'll run better with small data sets. It's probably the point where it would make no difference. You know, if you've got an array of you know a handful of values and you call you call find a find array, well, yeah, basically useless. Hmm. But as you can say, there's, there's a big bottleneck bottleneck in that function just by doing that. We go back to our other test image, which was this one here. Yeah, so it's doing it half the time. So half that time is lost just calling that function. It's pretty crazy. So we set the number of 
steps less this chopping step process here to less where are we if we force the search depth here just to be to like be like one or something like that um, yeah so it, it it fell through that logic in two and a half 250 milliseconds It's probably a sweet spot for each each one of these actually. The number of binary chop set steps compared to the number of searches. Well, there you go. It took six seconds this time here. So this one here definitely likes to have more. Works better when, when we do a lot of the chopping ourselves and calling that function less with smaller. That's twice as fast just by doing that. What if we go to, to six potential levels? Two to the power, power of six. Yeah. That's when we start to level out. There'll be a point where it, just, it, wouldn't, it won't get any faster because we're actually we're doing all the same logic. Well, that's slow in that case. <laughs> Terrific. Hmm, anyway, something to look look over and try and improve. I think we can improve what we already have. So that's something we can do kind of now. If we can slot something else in to do binary chop or have another few little features tacked in there for, for good measure, then see how we go. All right. Have a good weekend and I'll see you next time. Bye.